Welcome to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and tonight we're talking with John Horsch. He is the founder and coordinator at Social Action Linking Together, better known as SALT. He's been doing this work since 1983. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for being Glad here. Glad to be here. It's my honor. So this is a very important night. This is um, a show post-election on November 5th. Amazing things happened here in Virginia. The leadership of both our House and our Senate flipped to Democratic control. And I'd like to start by giving a shout out to the Speaker of the House designee, Eileen Fillercorn, who is the first woman speaker in Virginia's 400 for 100th legislative year, I would like to give a shout out to Charnel Herring, who is now the Democratic leader, now the majority leader in the House, and to Rip Sullivan, who is now the Democratic caucus chair. This is new leadership. It's a new day here in Virginia. And the reason we're talking with John Horsch is that SALT has, for many, many years, had an extensive legislative agenda focused on human services and the kinds of legislation that impact multitudes of ordinary Virginians across the Commonwealth. And this has not always been easy. He's been working on some things for really over a decade. And we're going to probably talk about some of those tonight. But I want to start out by talking about um, some of the criminal justice reform legislative items. Um, During the election, there were a lot of Commonwealth attorneys races that really focused on criminal justice reform. And this is because we are over incarcerating Virginians as well as in the entire United States is over incarcerating individuals. And what does this mean? What is the impact on the people when they're serving time? And what is the impact on people after they get out? We need to care because so many Virginians are being crippled Um, by incarceration and post-incarceration. So, John, I will let you take it away, um, talking about, so let's start from inside the jail. What are some of the hurdles to the the many Virginians who are incarcerated in jails and prisons across the Commonwealth? Well, first let me uh, say that uh, congratulations, Virginia. Uh, (laughs) This has been the most massive and the biggest turnout in a non uh, non, uh, presidential or yeah, governor's race. Yeah, yeah. in, in an off-year election yep. year, yes. And, and that, that's, uh, for us, that's very encouraging because uh, in uh, 2017, there were like uh, 15 districts had uh, flipped. And uh, of those 15, 11 were flipped by uh, new young women. That's right. And... Uh, Usually, uh, newly elected legislators are seldom seen and or seldom heard, but uh, you know, seen but seldom heard. And uh, these uh, women came equipped to uh, to make a difference to conduct business. Yeah. Yes, and they uh, did. They were very articulate, uh, very intelligent, and we noticed uh, a. Uh, a, a lot of uh, improvement in our ability to get uh, things done for prisoners and for families. Uh, for uh, Families are forgotten in Virginia. They're still forgotten. And, uh, you know, Virginia is number one for business, but uh, we're not number one for uh, families, and we should be. And that's how we got into prison issues. There's the TANF, Temporary Assistance for uh, needy families program, which serves, uh, which is actually people don't realize the children's program. It serves families and children, and we got into a scrap with the Department of Social Services because uh, a lot of times the family is on TANF in need of help because uh, one of the parents is in prison. But Department of Social Services works with the family, doesn't, but doesn't seems to ignore the father or the mother who is in prison and treats them as if they're not part of the family. So we uh, tried to uh, uh, get uh, TANF um, expanded to uh, allow the prisoner who maybe uh, have a drug record or a drug felony to be able to get TANF because that would be transitional assistance for his or her 
uh, reentry uh, to go back. It would uh, facilitate the family reintegration. It would help bring him into the family, and uh, DSS seemed to uh, really kind of uh, resist that. You know, they they were, uh, wanted to work with the family and the heck with the person from uh, prison about. Uh, you know, when you'd say uh, the word family, it would not include the, the prison because I guess they kind of thought they were bad or something, <laughs> that uh, they would be bad for the family. So anyway, we got into uh, uh, prison issues kind of through the back door, you know, right. kind of stumbled into it. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we've had some considerable success. And uh you know, uh, we learned uh, early on that uh, in prison when a mother, uh, sometimes a woman goes into prison, uh, she's pregnant, and when, when she uh, go, went to, uh, into labor that she would be shackled and taken into a, a hospital in shackles. And, uh, you know, that's really very dangerous with her balance. She could fall and uh, it could be harmful to her and the child and this kind of thing. So we got a bill put in and um, basically it was scrubbed in a subcommittee, subcommittee uh, for uh, militia, prisons, and public safety, which uh, has subcommittees there for the purpose of killing legislation. So... uh, when uh, they scrubbed it, they defeated the bill in subcommittee. Uh, I went to the patron and said, what are we going to do? And he says, well, let's go see the director of, uh, of corrections. And uh, he denied that they were shackling. And then when we confronted him and said, well, we had documented five women who had been shackled from guest house, uh, had documented them. Then he says, well, uh, I'm new here. And I didn't know that was going on. And he says, I'm as concerned as you are. And so we said, well, you'll support our legislation. And he says, yes, absolutely, but I have a better idea. We'll draft regulations. You come in and review them. We'll take them to the prison uh, policy board. Well, we had no idea that uh, there was a prison policy board. And anyway, it was passed unanimously. So uh, anyway, so... Yeah, so it wasn't that Patrick Hope's bill? Yes, yes it was. he was. Absolutely, so yes. so for those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and I'm talking with John Horsch. He is the founder of Social Action Linking Together, and he has been in the advocacy game since 1983. So I'm um, glad to have you here on Radio Fairfax talking about these issues. And you bring up something important when you talk about committees and subcommittees. For yes. those listeners who don't understand how bills get made, the composition of the committees is very important. And the party in power has always had the ability to pack each committee and subcommittee with majority members of their own party, yes. which makes it almost impossible for the minority party to get anything passed. And that's been going on since 1993, I think. So when you say it's a new day in Virginia, people need to understand that this is just unreal having committees. In fact, they're starting to announce committee chairs um, and committee assignments. What this means to have Democrats in the majority on these committees in both the Senate and the House. So tell us some of the other things that you're working on. Some of the uh, additional, to follow up on that, uh, some of the additional intrigue is, uh, for example, in the militia prisons uh, committee, they set up subcommittees. Uh, which consist of as few as five legislators, and uh, they uh, meet at the pleasure of the chairman, so you never know when it's going to meet. They might... uh, 7 a.m. Yes. With less than 24 hours notice. Or 11 o'clock in the evening. Right. In in the uh, 11th floor broom closet or something. Right, with unrecorded votes in subcommittee. unrecorded votes. Unrecorded votes in subcommittees. And uh, if it's a uh, subcommittee of five... Uh, it can meet with a quorum of three, so they, all they need is two votes to kill a major bill, major uh, prison bill. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is a pattern where there's 
so extensive that they're known and referred to as killer committees. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, they kill a lot of good legislation as uh, killed it. And that's what happened with our shackling, anti-shackling bill. So we got kind of got used to kind of finding ways around it. And, right. Yeah, so uh, the other thing about the committee, uh, uh, when the Democrats were in the majority, the subcommittee was only advisory. It had to go to the full committee, but then when the Republicans came in, they had the power in subcommittee to kill it. It would never see the day in the uh, in the full committee so where okay. votes are recorded, yeah. the, yes. and you can you can well, hold your representative yes. accountable for their vote. Yes, and when they're uh, when they're not recorded, you can't you know if the committee is fifteen or twenty members, you can't see whose lips are moving right. which way. But we had a really neat experience on uh, our ban the box bill. Uh, the Republicans, I think, were feeling a little guilty that they should pass it, but they had decided they were going to defeat it. So they, when they called for a voice vote, they just kind of, uh, some of them only a whisper, yeah. uh, so they couldn't be seen defeating it. And the uh, Republicans were 15 to 7 Democrats and the Democrats just screamed at the top of their voice. Yeah. So they won the they, they they won the voice vote. So then they had to do a recorded vote, and so all the Repu- it was partisan. Of course, it ended up with fifteen uh, Republicans voting against it. So anyway, that was a good strategy, yeah, though. Yes, yes. So any anyway. Um, it really gets exciting at times. So, yeah. Well, we should mention that the 2020 legislative <clears throat> session starts on January 8th, yes. I believe. It's it's 60 days this year, and even years it's 60 days, and odd, uh, odd years it's 45 days. Right. Still incredibly short for um, – it's incredibly short for – but we have got a part-time legislature, and not every state does. Virginia does. And for a, an economy and a state this yeah. size – citizen legislator. It's yeah. a citizen legislator. But they hear literally – there are thousands, thousands of bills. Yes, 2,000, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that are – so they struggle to really give a fair hearing – to everything. Well, I think what they do is uh, because they have so many bills, they're not interested in additional bills. When you approach them, they're interested in screening out bills. Right. Yeah. yeah so, but uh, we're real excited about our agenda for 2020, and we're very encouraged by the election results because we think, as we saw in 2017, the climate for our legislative proposals increased a hundred percent. Yeah. And we got so much more done after 2017. For example, it took me 15 years to get an increase for TANF benefits. After 2017, with those 11 new women and 15 seats being... The freshman 15. Yes. Uh, we got three increases in four years. So uh, what a turnaround. Yeah. It was just incredibly amazing. And, uh, you know, the first time... We got a success where I had to wait uh, 15 years before because I grew up in relative care, which would have been TANF. Uh, I, I actually broke down and cried. I was so, so excited and so, so amazed that they, that they uh, passed that. You know. Well, you make a good point, too. You know, a lot of people don't have the staying power. You've been in this game yeah, a, staying long, power, yes, a long yes, time, and you, yes. can't, you can't give up. But yeah. you have to have people willing to stay in it for 15 years yeah. or 10 years. Yeah. There's so, there's so much re- legislation that's been blocked. The one that comes to mind for me is the employment non-discrimination. This will be the 11th year that Equality Virginia has put that bill in. But this year, it's going to pass. Yes. And this year, in year 11, it will be signed into law. Yeah. Yes. So, well, we're excited about the fact that uh, we uh, have just learned that when prisoners uh, leave, when they get out of prison, that they don't have identification, which excludes them from uh, jobs. It excludes them from uh, services they need. It excludes them from getting food stamps it, uh, for uh, even renting or finding a place to stay. If they don't have an I- identification, they're kind of shut out. So anyway, we're working with uh, Patrick Hope now. Uh, we've just begun to work on this as to uh, get uh, have... Um, <clears throat> prisoners when they leave to be able to get have an ID. It's called a 
We're going to call it the Connect program, and it'll be administered through the uh, the uh, DMV. And uh, but uh, we came to the realization that this is flawed too, because if they can go to the DMV when they get out, and it takes several weeks before they get their ID. Uh, they, they, you know, how are they going to exist? How are they going in to, that amount of time? Yeah. Plus, so, if, they, if they don't have a fixed address, and here's the the yeah, main problem. Yeah. So, a lot of people may not yes. be aware that you can't go to the DMV and apply for like a driver's license or an ID card, and then yeah. you can get an ID card if you don't have, if yeah. you have, you can't have a PO box. Yeah. You have to have a street address, yeah. and so there are people with no fixed address. Yeah. So, what we're doing to uh, deal with that is to put in a bill to require that the prisons uh, provide the service of making sure that the, every prisoner leaves has an ID. So that would be part of like a pre-release program. Yes, it will be a pre-release program, so they'll hit the ground running. And I remember reading in the Norfolk paper about this guy that got out of prison one minute after midnight so they could claim the per diem for the day. And he wasn't there. They didn't have to feed him. Coldest day in winter in January with a $40 check and a bus ticket. And he had no family. The families had written him off. So it, within a week, he was back in prison. And so uh, our effort here is to help them to hit the grow, you know. Hit the from, ground running, right. Yeah, from I mean, a reentry standpoint to help them succeed. Right, and we there's not nearly enough reentry programs in the Commonwealth no, of Virginia. Very not few, nearly very enough. Few, yeah. We're fortunate here in the Fairfax area, in the Northern Virginia area, we, we have good, you know, OAR and yeah. Friends of Guest House, and, and even that's inadequate for the number of people yeah. being released well, every House day. Guest has only 29 women. I know, and they're the them. largest reentry program for women yeah. in, the, in the whole yeah. Commonwealth yeah. of Virginia. Yes. Yeah. It's totally inadequate. Yeah. But, you know, I would point out, too, that even getting a job requires identification for the I-9, yes, Employment Verification absolutely. Form. And generally, you can, if you've got a copy of your birth certificate, you can get it. Social Security Administration will give you a copy of your Social Security card. What you can't get is the driver's license if you don't have an yeah. address. And, and there is a waiting, yeah. there's a, a gap. And how do you get to your employment or to your uh, work or to even to a job interview? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I think it's just something that people haven't thought about up to this point because until you brought it up, John, I had not thought about this, and I even work in this space. Yeah. For those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio, and the change maker I'm talking with tonight is John Horsch, and he is the founder and coordinator at Social Action Linking Together, and he's been in advocacy work since 1983, and we are delighted to have you here on Radio Fairfax, John. So what else are you working on? Well, uh, we have primarily focused on the TANF program, the human services uh, for strong families. Um, you know, uh, Virginia's uh, poor are forgotten, and uh, that means uh, that uh, they're still forgotten and they need a lot of uh, help. Uh, and um, they, in order to um, transition from welfare, uh, they need to know that their children are safe and they need security. And the program only meets uh, 20% of their uh, the poverty level. So with such limited assistance, uh, they're... Um, and, and it's so time-limited th th for them to have to get off uh, before they can get the remedial education or vocational or the credentials. Right, necessary uh, to get a living wage to, job. To get a decent job. Then, um, so what we're working, what's working against them is when they come onto the program, there's like a two-year limit. Well, by the time they get their daycare worked out and, and get into a program where they can, um, <laughs> where they can, uh, you know, have job prep and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, remedial education or, you know, again, as I said, credentializing or get a uh, – and complete an apprenticeship or something that will lead to a decent job, they're pushed off. They go off a cliff. So we're trying to get that extended beyond the two years, a continuous five years. So uh, I think we have a good shot at a DSS for the 
incredibly for the first time this year called and asked us what we're proposing, wanted to know, asked for our fact sheets so we have a good signal from them that this may be the year they're going to do the right thing. And so uh, these are the kinds of uh, programs that, uh, 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 for example, the drug individuals with drug records that get out of prison cannot ideally um, I check the DOJ uh, uh, website and it showed that uh, three quarters of the prisoners have children. And the goal uh, under TANF would be to bring the father back and reintegrate the family and bring the father back. But uh, if they have a drug record, they cannot get TANF. They, they cannot be on the TANF program. So we're trying to change that as well. Right. Yeah. So And they can't get food stamps. And they're not welcome to the family because if the mom or the relatives are raising two, three kids and they don't have enough resources to uh, uh, keep a roof over their head, they're struggling uh, for, to, for, for the father or the person coming out of prison not getting any assistance. That means that uh, the limited resources they have has to be stretched, spread, stretched, yeah, stretched to four instead yeah. of three if there's two kids and a mom. So uh, You know, there's there's just so many, col- there's so much collateral damage collateral around, damage, around incarceration. Yes, and, yes, that, and I think yes, when you yes. heard people talk during this election about criminal justice reform, it was trying to shine a light on the fact that we criminalize poverty in so many ways. Cash bail is one of the ways yes. we criminalize poverty. Uh, fines and fees up until this past year, I think it became effective in July. If you had court fines and fees or other sorts of fines and fees, you couldn't get a dri- you couldn't get your driver's license until you paid them off. Yeah. Again, criminalizing poor people yeah. and making it even harder for them to get back on their feet. And I just think the general public may be not aware yeah. of that. They don't get automatic restoration of their voting rights when they're felt. And even though you talk about ban the box. Ban the box is not for, I mean, you can ban the box, but almost every agency and business does a background check. Yes. And every leasing company for an apartment does a background check. So even after you ban the box, all you've done is delay someone finding out you have a record. Right. So you don't, you're not paying. It's not the solution. It's not. It's like you pay your dues. You go to jail and you pay your dues. No, you pay for the rest of of your life. Yeah. And to your point, you, so does your family. Yeah, and you can just hope with the ban the box that uh, they'll at least get considered. And uh, uh, as opposed to if there's a box and you check it that you have a record, then it goes into it the trash. It goes in the trash. Yeah. But there's so many people, and I, again, I go back to Friends of Guest House, which is a great program. Carrie Galloway is the executive director there. And, you know, the the women who come through her program, one of the things that they learn to do is to tell their stories. And, and they do it yeah. in front of committees and they do it to the public and they do it in interviews and in the media to, to tell, you know, nobody grows up thinking that yeah. they're going to end up being incarcerated yeah. or homeless or yeah. poor. And so, you know, these women will tell you that they have been offered a job, you know, and they're supposed to start. And then the offer is rescinded when the background check comes back. Yeah. I was on uh, pointed to the criminal um, counsel under uh, Bob McDonald, and uh, at the end we had a hearing, and a woman testified, and I thought she had to be some really well-known, top-of-the-line uh, advocate. And then when I met her, I was struck. I was. Uh, really surprised to find out she was one of the women that came out of guest, guest house. house she was a prisoner and she was so articulate but by god you knew she that she knew what she was talking about you know so and, and this is the credibility thing. there the, yeah. and so so many of the women that i have met you know uh, a lot of them end up in prison because of drug addiction yeah. and and how it ends up being drug addiction is because you make poor choices about feeding your drug habit and that's what you actually get yeah. incarcerated for yeah well, and some of them get incarcerated because uh, they they get prescriptions and then they get hooked. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, they get desperate. So, 
anyway. So, well, we have another proposal that I'm really proud of. Uh, we found out that uh, prisoners, when they have uh, to go to uh, get medical treatment, they have to pay a $5 copay. And a lot of them have jobs in the prison, le- legitimate jobs, where they make from 10 cents or 20, 20 you cents know, we an have, hour. You know, we have talked about this before, John. We're going to go to a break. Okay. But when we come back, we are going to talk about the fact that there is a long history of, of prison labor yes. and, and, and underpaying prisoners and then charging them for everything yes. they consume or have in prison. So you're listening to Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. We are talking with John Horsch, who is the founder and coordinator at Social Action Linking Together. And we're going to a short break, but please join us after the break. And we do have a call in number if you want to ask questions. So join us. This is Radio Fairfax, a public access cable and internet station provided by Fairfax Public Access, a 501c3 organization in Fairfax County, Virginia. Al Cooper, Brooks Williams, Al Stewart, Cheryl Wheeler, Arlo Guthrie, Chris... Contemporary singer-songwriter folk artists side-by-side with long-standing esoteric rock performers. That's what Eclectic Hours is. It's music for baby boomers, music where you gotta listen to the words. Eclectic Hours, Sunday mornings from 10 a.m. to noon. James Taylor, Kate Campbell, Joe Cocker, Livingston Taylor. Free for me bringing you musical gems rarely heard on the radio. Hear the White Stripes, St. Vincent, and the Hot Melts. Free for me, Tuesday at 5 on Radio Fairfax. Let's go down into the subway station where you hear the strangest things. Every Saturday at 4 o'clock on Night Train Memories, Sounds of the Cities. Want to hear what there is in jazz besides the usual big names? Come listen to The Outer View, where you'll hear vocalists, pianists, jazz rock, jazz from foreign countries, and much more, going all the way from the mainstream to the cutting edge. The exploring happens on The Outer View with Jerry Howard, Tuesdays 2 to 3, on Radio Fairfax. same old oldest stations playing the same tracks over and over again if you want to hear some great 50s music you probably never heard before come and listen to my show colin davies the professor of rock here on thursdays from four till six the radio programs aired by fpa reflect the viewpoints of individual producers and do not necessarily represent those of the station its staff or supporters. Like what you hear? Like what you see? Lights, camera, action. Here's your chance to put your voice and talent to use. What are you waiting for? Your show could be the next big hit. Get involved. Attend a free orientation. Learn to create your own radio and television show. We have courses in radio and television production, post-production, and much more. Come volunteer on a show and sharpen your skills. Don't delay. Don't hesitate. Pick up the phone and call us at 571-749-1102 or visit our website, www.fcac.org slash orientation. Welcome back to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. And tonight here on Radio Fairfax, we are talking with John Horsch. He is the founder and coordinator at Social Action Linking Together. And we have a call-in number, 703-560-TALK. That's 703-560-8255. If you've got a question for John Horsch, John, when we went to the break, we were talking about what prisoners are paid. And this is something we've talked about on the show before, because it goes back to post-Civil War 
during the Reconstruction, um, and is really firmly rooted in institutional racism, where people were picked up for loitering and put in jail. And then this convict labor was leased out to build roads and dams and in coal mines and in cotton fields. And this has continued. And there are prisoners doing work. The example I like to use is in California during the wildfires. There were prisoners out there fighting fires next to professional firefighters for like $2 a day. So, you know, there's a long history of of using prison and convict labor, paying them pennies and then charging them for meals, for medical, for, you know, women were paying for tampons up until this past year when legislation was passed that made them available for free. So talk a little bit about how you're trying to change that. Well, we've discovered that the median pay for legitimate jobs uh, that they, otherwise they would have to hire staff and pay uh, the going wage, uh, that they're working for a median wage of 29 cents. So that means a lot of them are working for much, a lot of them are working for much less than 29 cents an hour. Right. But then they're being gouged for uh, prison uh, telephone calls. Uh, uh, they have to pay a $5 copay if they have to have uh, um, see a doctor or medical care or a nurse. And uh, basically, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, on their income f- to pay the copay, they have to work an average of 11 hours. And uh, because... Uh, uh, it's so expensive, uh, they avoid going, which means they contaminate the other prisoners that move through the prison, and uh, it's uh, uh, just a very uh, loose, losing kind of uh, uh, a, a, a policy, you know. Right. So what we're trying to do is just get rid of the copay entirely. We're putting in legislation. I understand from my... Uh, I understand from my patron that it's going to be very hard left, but uh, I, th- I think it's something we can do if we're persistent, if we uh, keep at it. Uh, I Just uh, a sidebar, uh, uh, it, you mentioned the tampons. Uh, they're charged for not only telephone calls, but they have... Um, you know, like if they have a snack, a canteen, right? Uh, if they get a little bag of uh, potato chips, it's like five dollars or something. Yeah, it's it's it's, yeah. it's astronomical, astronomical how they gouge yeah, how they gouge yeah, it. Yeah, and it means the uh, the company that's uh, providing these services is making out like bandits, right? They, uh, because there's only ones yeah. like for for menstrual hygiene project products. I think there were like two vendors, yeah. and they had to use one of these two, and they were yeah. of cheap quality, terrible quality. Yes, yeah. and to buy them was like you paid five times what you would pay going to CVS. Yeah, and that's unconscionable to me. Yeah. But the the thing with the the five dollar copay is that this is a public health issue. This is a community of people living in very close quarters all together. So not treating sick people who are sick. Uh, it's the, again, when we talk about collateral damage. It's this like is another wildfire. It's yeah. just like another yeah, unintended yeah, consequence yeah, yeah. of making it difficult for people to get the things that they need. Well, and the thing is, you know, we want them to be responsible citizens. We know that ninety percent of them are going to come back to our communities. They're going to be our neighbors, and uh, you know, if they were paid a decent wage. They could uh, designate it for their child support or they could send it back to their families or they could use it for, uh, you know, paying off their court fees and and these things, which would teach them responsibility that if they work, they can earn money and they can... uh, And rejoin society because they have the resources to do it. And that they would have less fees and child support because it all accumulates when they get out because it accumulates sometimes into thousands of dollars, dollars yeah. i know so, anyway. so t- talk a little bit of, i know this is something you've been very focused on is uh, the use of solitary confinement and that has really been a sticking point with the department of corrections yeah. well uh they've come a long way they have put in what they call their um gosh i'm blocking for a second here 
Um, I know that there was a study that, the, 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 that they were going to study because one of the things I think the question had been asked is, you know, oh, under what situations yeah. are they using it? How yeah. often is it used? What is the process for somebody going? Well, supposedly they put in a step-down program. That's what I was having trouble putting my finger on. And that is uh, supposedly the uh, goal is to allow the person in solitary confinement to set a goal, and if he meets it, then he can have his time reduced. And they claim that they have reduced the use of solitary confinement substantially. But what we found is, while they have reduced it, they deny they have people in solitary confinement, uh, and uh, that's because they're calling it... um, everything under the sun. Except solitary confinement. Yeah, yeah. And and so um, we got to the point where um, we couldn't trust what they were saying about uh, the fact that uh, they're not using it anymore. They call it segregated housing and Uh. and, uh, uh, they have other terms and they have like uh, rating uh, MH1, 2, 3, and 4 and these people are in solitary confinement, but because they're in these other units, they deny they're in solitary confinement. So they're playing a lot of games. So um, they defeated us uh, two years in a row. Uh, we had an excellent bill, which we, uh, we imported from uh, New Jersey. And in New Jersey, it passed, but Governor Christie vetoed it. But anyway, we like the bill. It re- limits um, solitary confinement to 15 days because medically um, it's right. been documented it, that they go lunatic after right, that. Right, right. It caused mental health it, issues. And, and for the mentally ill, um, to eliminate it entirely. And that was the uh, New Jersey bill, and that's what we wanted. So uh, that was defeated. So what we did because of our persistent nature is the next year we put in a bill requiring them to do reporting, to report how many are in, why, how long, and they had to, we, we got it through. They fought us tooth and nail, but we, um, we got it through, and, um, and we got the first report, and uh, it, uh, we were right, what we suspected. There's an awful lot more people in, for example, 160-some went directly, fr- they denied that this would ever happen, directly from a solitary confinement into the community. Can oh, you imagine wow. being in solitary confinement sometimes for months? And, and then being released. they come out there angry and, and uh, anger management and, and uh, you know, mentally... Uh, you know, uh, really, I mean, it's suffering. A, it really, know. it's a stressor. It's a yeah. stressor You're to be in. Stressed. It's stressed. a stressor. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and the change maker we're talking to tonight is John Horsch, who is the founder of Social Action Linking Together. And you really bring up important points about the fact that there should be some transparency. I mean, I think that's really what, you know, there are definitely uses for solitary confinement, mm-hmm. especially if people are in a position to harm others yes. or, or in a crisis. But it has to be limited. And why isn't there a process? Why don't we know it? Why isn't there reporting? Because these are basic things that you, is not going to, you know, impact the quality yeah. of incarceration yeah. except to make it better. Yes, absolutely. And our bill it calls for a mental uh, evaluation within 72 hours after they go in. And, uh, you know, they eliminate it for the mentally ill. But we found out from this report also that there were 484 of 500 in, in right now in uh, solitary confinement. And so all the uh, reasons that were given to defeat our bill now through the reporting process, uh, even though there are 484, it seems that during the year there were over 7,000 in. And uh, that just seems very heavy handed yeah. and not, not yeah. to the benefit well, that's of the about person who's 25 percent of the population. population. So yeah. the use is really still very extensive. And um, anyway, um, it's been a struggle, and uh, we're coming back now for a reasonable bill to limit. Uh, we met with the uh, 
director of mental services for the corrections, and she said that 10 years ago, 11% of the prisoners were, had mental illness, some degree of mental illness. She says now that's 30%. And she said they don't have enough staff anywhere, right. uh, 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 trained staff or, or enough uh, staff to be able to... Uh, Handle the psychiatric yeah, needs. Yeah, I mean, to meet the need. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. and if you and you know that kind of mirrors the problem on the outside too. Just in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the resources necessary to help those who are mentally ill, adequate beds in rural areas, adequate professionals, especially those who deal with adolescents. In some areas of the Commonwealth, there's one or there's none, and so I, I just think the the prison systems are reflecting a much a, a bigger problem with yeah. mental health services in Virginia, and it doesn't get well funded either. Well, it seems like the uh, prisons are the uh, mental health hospitals now. That's, yeah. That's, yeah, it's been criminalized, and, and you know, for 30 percent of the prisoners to be uh, should be uh, in treatment rather than in prison is right. outrageous. It's, it's just not, uh, you know, it's not good public policy. No, You're absolutely exactly. right. Yeah. What other things are you hoping to get in front of our newly formed committees here in 2020? Well, it's going to be a busy year, isn't I it? I know. <laughs> I plan to just camp out down in Richmond myself. Yeah, I think I'll have to, too. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the um, fact is that people don't know is that the TANF program – which is a children's program, again, you have to keep being reminded, it's like a three-tier program, and the level of support that they get in the urban areas is much higher than in the rural areas or the uh, middle, median areas. So uh, I went into uh, Bill Stanley's office, who helped me with the uh, shared work program to get it through, uh, through with his guidance. Uh, he was very good, very strong. And um, he said, uh, you know, what are you up to? And I said, well, you know, I said, uh, you're from southwest Virginia. and uh, Martinsville. Yeah. And I said, uh, your district is, uh, probably receives the least benefits. And, are, uh, exi- and there's crushing poverty yes. there. And I said, you know, there's high unemployment, uh, lack of education, lack of opportunity, and they're the ones that need the most help. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, we could just lift the bottom level up to the middle level. And um, I said, this would make a huge difference for the families uh, that are struggling and um, you know, just to struggling to keep a roof over their head and, and to have feed, feed the family. So he says, go out there and write a budget amendment. He got it through. I tell you. It isn't very often that we get a bill through in one year. I know. And I will say this about Senator Stanley. He has passed some really good legislation yeah. on education as well. Yeah. And um, I, th- I think he has the best interests of especially families and children yes. at, at heart. And his yeah. district does struggle. Yeah. But what benefits his district also benefits the rest of the Commonwealth yes. of Virginia. Yes. It was an education for me to find out how many of the counties and localities throughout the state uh, were in that lowest tier, almost all of them. And there are just a few in the middle and even fewer in the top where they get a higher uh, benefit. So Guess what? We're coming back this year to take the group middle? two, the middle group, <laughs> and, and raise it up, it up to, one. to the top one. Ta-da. Because they have to pay the same amount for a for a loaf for of bread, bread as, right? as in yeah. the rural areas, in the urban areas. So, and you know, I could uh, appreciate the need for a differential if the benefits were at a reasonable uh, survival rate, but. They're so far, be, even in the highest rate, they're so so far, far below behind subsist- you know, subsistence. subsistence yeah. So far below yeah, subsistence. So, so I figure if we lift the uh, group two up into the highest group, uh, we're, we're not, you know, we're not being too generous. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and I will point this out, you know, for anybody who thinks, you know, and this whole mythology of the welfare queen has benefited no one. 
And that narrative and that mythology has just endured since 1980. And it needs to go away because it is a mythology. No one is, nobody enjoys being poor. No one is sitting around plotting to get extra food stamps. That's just, it's not happening. But, you know, it's Maslow's hierarchy of need. If you don't have enough to eat or a place, a warm place to sleep, or if you don't feel safe, you never get past that. All you're ever doing every day of your life is surviving. So struggling. Just surviving. So how do we expect people to get out there and support their families, you know, and contribute to the community, you know, to raise the next generation of kids who have had enough to eat and a good education Mm -hmm. and a stable home. And these programs are not handouts. Mm -hmm. They're assistance so that people can get back on their feet and stabilize their lives. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're um, young enough Old enough to remember uh, Dear Abby? Yes, I do remember <laughs> okay. Dear Abby. I do. Well, this young man wrote in, uh, somebody uh, criticized uh, welfare recipients in a letter to her that she published in which they said they should pull themselves up their, by their bootstraps. And he says, I used to believe that ing- ignorant stuff too, and I used to uh, say the same thing. But he says, you know what? Uh, I had a nervous breakdown, and he says, if I go into the store and I can't find the bullion cubes, I break down hysterically, or I have to wait in line to pay the cashier, I, I, I can't deal with it. He says, I'm going to need help the rest of my life. And he says, you better believe it when people turn up request help they they need it uh, don't, don't, you know he says i've learned the hard way but he says uh don't believe that crap that yeah <laughs> that uh, people have been sending in about welfare queens and and uh, you know we, we keep trying to to he says i would give anything to be able to not have to take assistance help, assistance most but people don't want he assistance says, i am reconciled to the fact that i am going to need this the rest of my life and here he's just a young man and here's the thing too is that we keep thinking about poverty as being some sort of failure of character yes. a failure of the individual instead of a failure of the system that it's situational there's a lot of people who lose their job after 40 years you know and they they don't have another skill set and no one will hire yeah. them. And then what do you do? I yeah. mean, it's not because they haven't worked hard all their lives. Yeah. It's that the situation changed. Yeah. And I've testified for years to, uh, you know, I said it took 15 years to get an increase. And the year that I got an increase in TANF benefits for uh, families was the year that I realized myself, I hadn't realized this before, that most of the people on TANF. Uh, coming out of the recession when the economy tanked were on because they had low-paying jobs and they did not have unemployment compensation like the other people. Right. And so TANF was their unemployment compensation. So when um, I read letters to the editor about people getting unemployment compensation that they got 400 or $450 a week and how are they supposed to live on it? And I say, well, how is this family that is on welfare that gets $269 a month, how are they supposed to survive? I mean, you know. Exactly. The, the disparity there is just incredulous just because they are low-income workers. For those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and I'm talking with John Horsch tonight. He is the founder of Social Action Linking Together, better known as SALT. And, you know, I I would point out that with the last government shutdown, which was so prolonged, that there were people put in dire circumstances who'd never been there before. You know, there were nonprofits who were now serving families who didn't have paychecks for more than one paycheck cycle who needed food because they had to pay their mortgage, right? And suddenly people who never thought that it could happen to them, people who thought that, you know, I will never be in that situation were suddenly in that situation. And I wonder to myself, you know, if those people are going to remember that when, you know, these bills come up or when we talk about expanding benefits and who we're expanding benefits for is that anybody can drop from where they are to a place they never imagined they could yeah. be. 
I found that out when I lived in St. Louis. Uh, I was a deputy director for the welfare office and headed up the food stamp program. It was only just a pilot project at the time. And the uh, Teamsters went on uh, strike and they settled almost overnight. It was really quickly, but the St. Louis Teamsters wildcatted. They wouldn't settle and that dragged on for weeks. And every, you wouldn't realize this, but every small business depended on the Teamsters in some way or another and had to lay off their staff. And in the morning, I'd get up at 5 o'clock and I'd turn on the radio and I would hear the radio personality saying, you should see the lines down at the welfare office there or down the street and around the corner and up the block. I mean, <coughs> uh, these were people who were living, had jobs living from paycheck to, to paycheck. paycheck. And uh, they thought it could never happen, happen to, to them. them. And I there know. they were. I know. And I think people just need to remember that, you know, this is totally down they a bunny trail. They were strikers. They, they were people who depended for their jobs on, on yeah, you know, I know. The but so. But this is kind of down a bunny trail, but the new... Uh, Tom Hanks film coming out about Mr. Rogers. Okay. It's oh, about yeah, to hear the, yeah. you know, and this is one of the things. I saw that, the preview. I know, right? And and but here's one of the things that he truly believed in, and that was to be kind. Yes. And compassionate, and to be a helper or find a helper, and this movie couldn't be hitting at a better time yeah. when we really need to we really re need it, we need yes. to rethink how we think about those who struggle, and we need to be the helper. Or we need to help find the helpers, yeah. but we need to be kind and compassionate yeah. because it could be any one of us. Well, we have to look at when did caring stop? Yeah. You know, when are we going to turn it around? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. so, well, I'm excited because I know I will see you down in Richmond. We're also yes. going to do a series of shows. So I'm going to plug. I'm going to plug other. Go we ahead. have we have another show. We have another show called Inside Scoop. The producer of this show, Ben Zool, also produces that show. And we are working on putting together a series of panels because John wants to really attack specific legislative issues and bring on experts who can answer the public's questions. Including legislators. And legislators, too, because we want them to be fully participating. But what are some of those shows and panels that you hope to put together? Well, we, we were, I, I think, you know, I'm excited about the next session um, because of the, um, the change that occurred after 2017. I think that change is going to be accelerated. It's going to be even better. And I know we were one of the first way back when we had a Fair Wage Act to increase the minimum wage. And I know there have been legislators from this area who have fought for several years to increase the minimum wage. But I think maybe they got a good shot at it. And if nothing else, at least they can uh, get uh, permission for localities to raise the wage and to have uh, a living wage and this kind of thing. So the other thing I'm excited about is I think that there's going to be a lot of movement on anti-gun violence. Yes, yes. yes. I, Let's I talk think, about uh, that because yeah, there was just because, a shooting uh, today. Yes, And yes. it's it's uh, November 14th, so at the NRA on the 14th of every month, there are protests yes. in front of the NRA headquarters. Our producer, Ben Zul, was there today. And in the midst of their demonstration, um, there was a school shooting in California, which just drive drives home the fact that, you know, it's just not going to stop. It's not going to stop until somebody yeah, stops it. Yeah, and we it. really need to deal with the issue of the, uh, you know, the um, do 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 the big weapons. Yeah, the assault the assault, assault rifle. weapons. Yeah, yeah because yeah. nobody needs to have assault weapons. The military needs and to have bump, assault weapons. The, the high capacity bump uh, stocks. Bump stocks. Yeah. Gun show loopholes. Mm -hmm. Universal Mac background bump. checks. You know, yeah. but people lump under. Common sense yeah. gun legislation. And we were going on our way to Richmond uh, during the last session when uh, we uh, heard on the way up uh, that the Senate just had, uh, in one swoop, defeated 28 gun anti-gun violence bills. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. You know something, John? I think you're right. I don't think those grouping together and killing of bills is going to happen now that the Democrats are in no, charge. No. So it's a new day dawning. I want to thank you for having oh, been on the you. show tonight. It was an honor. It was always a thrill to talk to you. I'm going to tell people to stay tuned for additional shows yeah. on Inside Scoop, which is a television show that airs 
every Monday from 8 to 9 p.m. on Channel 10, which is also produced here at Fairfax Public Access, because we will be having shows about these um, issues. And I want everyone to get involved this year. The session runs from January 8th to the first week in March, and you too can have an impact. Every person listening can be a change maker, and you can make change by having your voice heard in the legislature. This is it for Making Change Radio.